around 4 a.m., the a, uh, deputy sheriff came to my door and, uh, you know, rang the doorbell. And I said, what's wrong? What happened? And he said, well, there was a motorcycle accident. And then immediately I knew it was Dominic. On April 12th, 2014, 23-year-old Dominic D. Simone died in a motorcycle accident. Dominic was a popular law school student, a young man of faith, son to parents Melanie and Hector, and cherished brother to a sister and two brothers. His death was shattering, especially to those closest to him. A year and a half after Dominic's passing, Dominic's mother Melanie began writing about the truths of grief and faith. Now her blog, The Life I Didn't Choose, has reached millions of people who have experienced profound loss. And today, Melanie De Simone joins us. Welcome to A Stronger Faith, a podcast that puts you in the arena with the experiences that changed people's faith and understanding of God in hopes that it'll shape your faith. I'm your host, Stacy McCants, and we spend a lot of time in prayer asking God to use these conversations to draw you toward Him. We're able to host amazing guests like the one you'll hear today because people like you who listen to these episodes reach out to us when they believe they know someone of great faith that may have a bit of a story behind their faith. If you know someone like that, we're asking that you consider reaching out to us to let us know. Our guests are everyday people of faith, not polished speakers. That's what makes the conversation so authentic and impactful. So if you know of someone that you believe could share their faith for the purpose of pointing people toward Christ, please visit astrongerfaith.com and click the button on the homepage that says, Recommend a Guest. We'll reach out and take it from there. It's an easy but amazing way that you can participate in evangelization, and we need your help. Today, Melanie D. Simone joins us to share some powerful spiritual truths about something all of us have to navigate, grief and faith. Melanie has an uncommonly strong handle on Scripture. This, coupled with her own experience as a bereaved parent and her immersion in grief communities, places Melanie in a great position to guide people of faith who struggle with grief. Please meet Melanie D. Simone. So today, Melanie D. Simone is with us, and I had a mutual friend of ours say early on, and this is probably over, it's, it's well over a year ago, we had had coffee or something, and he said, you know who you need to talk to is Melanie D. Simone, and I was like, I don't know who that is, and she said, he said, well... So he's a pastor. Pastor Fred Shuckert is his name, and, and he has been a pastor, but then, as you know, sort of organized and organizes a pastor's network, sort of a pastor for pastors. And I guess you know him through that. Is that right? Or did you go to church with him? Oh, no. Fred Fred was our pastor okay. for years and years. In fact, uh, as we'll get into, he, he was the one who... Um, performed our son's funeral. Okay. He was the first person I called Is that after right? I called family. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you guys have a deep, rich history. Yeah. Almost 30 okay. years. Wow. He is just a great guy. And every time, sometimes he gets on fire for what we're doing here and he'll call me and he'll say, I listen to this. And I can't believe this. And you should call this in person and this person and this person. And I'm like, thank you, Fred. <laughs> I've gotten some, we've had some great conversations with people because of him and his enthusiasm. So uh, you could not have been referred by someone more respected than Fred Shuckert. So I'm thankful for that. So as is the case in lots of our conversations, we didn't connect right away. But God always does those things in uh, good ways. And so you're here today. So Melanie, thank you. Thank you for having me. For coming. So this conversation, and we've had a handful of conversations that have been rooted in the loss of a loved one, and everybody experiences it in some way or another. I think probably the most challenging way I've heard of, and, and not to compare 
severity of bereavement because we can't do that because it hits people differently. But the loss of a child just is something about that and that out of order passing is just as a parent, especially maybe that's where I'm coming from as, as much as anything is just, it's almost too much. Maybe, maybe it is too much. It is too much. I mean, when you think of your children, when they're born, as you see them go off to school or however long they live and you're still living, you always think of their future, not their future deaths. That's just not yeah. even, I mean, you may occasionally you'll see a movie or you read a book and you'll think, oh, I just don't think I could survive that. But the reality is, is you really don't have any choice but to survive it. And it is too much. I mean, without the grace and strength of God, I honestly don't know how any parent survives it. Yeah. I mean, there are parents that do, and I can't speak to their experience. But I just know that without the Lord's help, there's absolutely no way. I would have survived. Yeah, yeah. And I guess we're approaching eight years since you lost Dominic. Correct. Talk okay. about Dominic. I, I've read things about him. I, when I when I researched you and him, I found a lot about him, and I found articles in papers written about him and the kind of person his he was and the impact that he seemed to have on so many people in such a positive way. Speak about him. Well, the way I can speak about him is basically in the context of our family, and then I'll speak a little more about him specifically. We have four children. Uh, a daughter is the eldest, and then we have three sons. Dominic was the second of three, so he was a middle child in every conceivable way. Yeah. You know, He was the middle of three brothers, and he was yeah. the third of four. And he was always his own person. And very opinionated. I can remember as a child, we homeschooled. And I can remember one day, one of the assignments was we were going to do a, an outdoor nature study. And he was supposed to draw a leaf. It was just a leaf. And I gave him all kinds of options. I said, you can even trace the leaf. He didn't want to draw the leaf, so he wasn't going to draw the leaf. And I mean, it was hours. This kid was fighting me for this. So that's that's the kind of tenacity that, that yeah. Dominic had. And... He was driven, he was smart, he was analytical and thoughtful, and he was a very, very, very good friend and a good son and a good brother. And if he could do something for someone, which is probably what you're referring to in the articles that you read, when he was in law school, one of the things my kids grew up doing was fixing cars because my husband is a good mechanic. And Dominic became the law school mechanic. And so kids would, you know, they'd have these old beater cars going to law school. Nobody had money. And uh, they'd need an alternator changed. And he'd be like, you know, buy the alternator, I'll fix it. And he'd, he'd bring his tools and he'd go in the parking lot of the apartments that they lived in and fix, you know, fix their alternators or whatever. And um, that was just how he was. He had a really good friend who couldn't afford internet at his apartment. And so he gave him a key and said, you know, come over to my place and use the internet. But Dominic was, in some ways, he was a strong truth teller. He could point out things that other people might be blind to. He was definitely a mirror for me in a lot of respects, and I really, really miss that. He would say, Mom, you know, you're being too, oh, let's see, what would be the word? Sometimes I would let people take advantage of me because I'm a, I'm a servant, I have a servant's heart, you yeah. know, and, um, and I was a firstborn people pleaser. So that's kind of how I do things. And he would say, mom, you need to stop that, you know, and I needed to hear that. And he's a voice that's missing from my life now. But he, he knew what he wanted to do. He, another really great story about him is he wanted to be a, um, he wanted to get a communications degree. And he didn't realize it until after he had been in college for a semester. Well, it's a very structured course at UAB, and you have to follow the, the course in a very specific way. And he missed the first semester. So instead of being frustrated by that, he went to the director of that uh, course of study, and he said, look, is there any way I can make up that semester? Can I read something? Can I do something? Can I write a paper? Can I get into this, this course of study? And the guy was impressed. 
And he said, sure, I'll give you these books. You read them, you, you come and talk to me and we'll see about it. So he was let in to that course of study, even though he missed the first <laughs> semester and um, was allowed to continue to take that course. And that's, that's really a, a good example of how Dominic was. There was another time my husband worked for UAB and so we got half tuition. And there was one semester when no notice had been sent out that we needed to requalify for the half tuition. And so we got our tuition bills and it was like, you owe full tuition. And we're going, that's not right. So Dominic took it upon himself and went to the um, dean and said, hey, you didn't send a, you didn't send a uh, notice. You can't hold people responsible for what they didn't know. You know, we thought once you said your dad worked there and he was still working there, which they could verify if they wanted to. You know, it was a done deal. So that was the way Dominic was. He was very, he was always our person that we pushed to the um, complaint department, you know, <laughs> because he would not only get the complaint yeah. solved, you'd get money back. You yeah. know? <laughs> so. so he's uh, initiative and resourceful. Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, yeah. And he would have been a great lawyer. He was a, uh, he was yeah. finishing up his second <laughs> so. year, you know, when, uh, when he was killed. And so I could see him as an amazing advocate. And he was passionate about justice, you know, for people. He yeah. hated for someone to be taken advantage yeah. of. So, I mean, you know, I could go on and on. I could go on and on about any of my children, yeah. but, but I could keep going. But, but I think in a nutshell, that's who Dominic was. He, was. he was just very passionate. He was very compassionate. And he was also loving and kind. But he was a truth teller. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you asked him a question, be ready for the truth because, you know, he was going to tell you. <laughs> if you said, do these jeans look good, good, he was going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I got a little of that in me, too. And, um, and, and, and when I, if I don't tell you, I think I feel like I, I probably tell you anyway. My expressions aren't really good at that. Yeah. So I can relate to some of that, not maybe with uh, his ability to make everything happened like that. And, um, so that's, that's awesome. It's really good to hear stories like that and hear the personality and the character of some, someone like Dominic. Um, so what happened? Dominic was, it was a Friday night and he had decided to stay in that night and, uh, it was coming up on finals for, uh, the last semester of his second year in law school. And some friends called him about 10 p.m. and said, hey, you know, come meet us. It, I honestly cannot remember the name of the place, but it was one of those places that had uh, a pool table yeah. in the, downtown Tuscaloosa. And they liked to go and play pool and mess around. And so he decided to go on and go out that night. And it had been wet and rainy and cold for a large part of that, of the spring, March through April, which in Alabama means that we start to get spring then, although some other parts of the country are still very cold. Yeah. And the vehicle he had to use, the car he used, was a Suburban. But he also had a motorcycle. And so it was like a really nice night, and he was thinking, oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to take my motorcycle. And some of this I'm putting on him, but we know from conversations he had with his friends at the place. Um, that this was what he was thinking. So he took his motorcycle and he went out and he left about one in the evening or in the morning, I guess it would be on Saturday morning. And he headed back home. And as young men are wont to do, he was going way too fast yeah. because motorcycles are fun yeah. and curves are fun yep. and he's young and we're invincible. Mm, yep. And he went around a curve that was less than a mile from where his apartment is, and he missed the curve. And he went off the road, and um, part of what's hard for me as a mother is that he managed to steer through multiple obstacles. And he hit the last one, which oh. was a chain link fence, and he was thrown from his motorcycle. And according to the first responders, he died instantly. He had a helmet on. So for those of you that would wonder about that, he yeah. was, he had a helmet, he had a riding jacket, he had all the things that you're, long pants, all the things you're supposed to have on, but there was no recovery from mm. that. You know, the laws of physics are the laws of physics. Yeah. And um, so he died from blunt force trauma. And the provision of God in this was that the person whose yard he actually ended up in was a guy that also drove motorcycles 
and he happened to be in his shop. He would not normally have been there at that late hour, and he was in a shop, and he was messing with something, and he heard this crash, and he ran out there, and he saw Dominic, and he called to the, and he had, he had had a passing acquaintance with him because there was a service station, a gas station, not too far from where Dominic's apartment was and this man's uh, house was, and they'd kind of seen each other, you know, filling up their motorcycles. So the guy called 911 and stayed with him, but, you know, there was no hope. I mean, it was done. So he died at, um, I think he was declared at 1.10 a.m. on Saturday morning. When did you find out? We, um, because it was in Tuscaloosa County, I guess it's technically Tuscaloosa City was where he was. They called the sheriff in Bibb County, which is where I live in Alabama, which is a rural space outside of Tuscaloosa and about 30 miles from Tuscaloosa. And around 4 a.m., the a, uh, deputy sheriff came to my door mm. and, um, you know, rang the doorbell. And um, it was bizarre because my husband's name, Dominic's name is actually Hector Dominic. Mm-hmm. My husband's name is Hector Michael. And at the time, my husband was working in California. And when the deputy came to the door, first of all, of course, there's the shock of a doorbell ringing at 4 a.m. And you're like, oh, my goodness, what's happening? Yeah, it's nothing good there. But we have a lot of animals, and so including horses and goats. And so occasionally they would get out of their pens. And so initially I'm thinking animals are out on the road. You know, somebody needs us to corral an animal because we've had horses that have gotten out in the night. So then the guy says, you know, does Hector live here? Because Dominic's driver's license says Hector, Dominic, and most people would not know that he was called by Dominic. Right. And I'm like, yes. And I'm still, I'm still dumbfounded. I'm thinking something's happened to my husband in California and they're just trying to get in re- and but still not death. I'm not thinking death. I'm thinking you know, my husband's unconscious. They need somebody to, to make a decision or, or tell them what to do. Yeah. And I said, what's wrong? What happened? And he said, well, he was, a, there was a motorcycle accident. And then immediately I knew it was Dominic. And I knew that if he came it all, all the pieces fell into place. And I realized that he was dead. My youngest son was with us. Julian was with it, was with me that night. He still lived at home at the time. And my daughter happened to be spending the night that night. And so the three of us were there when the news came and it was a younger deputy. And, you know, I don't think he really knew what he was doing in the absolute sense. I don't know how many times he'd had to deliver this kind of news. And he had this little piece of paper with the scribbled name for the officer in Tuscaloosa and a phone number. And I had enough presence of mind to say, you need to come inside while I call this number, because I wanted, before I called family, I wanted to make sure it was Dominic. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to know how did they identify him? So I called the number and I said who I was. And I said, I need to know, how did you identify my son? And they said it was with his wallet and his, his um, driver's license. So I accepted that that was in fact Dominic, you know, before I was going to call anybody. So I'm there with my two children who are there. My oldest son, second child, but my oldest son was in West Virginia doing a, I think it's called a preceptorship for his veterinary degree, but it's where they go for six weeks and practice um, before they graduate. So I had to call him, had to call my husband in California, had to call my parents. And for some reason, my husband just wouldn't pick up his phone. And it turned out later that he had been charging it and it wasn't near his bed so he didn't hear it so I had to call him several times and in the meantime as I alluded to earlier I called Fred because you know you see things on television and you think you've got to go identify a body and Fred was a longtime family friend he had been with my children growing up and I said Fred I don't know what to do I have no idea what to do I said if somebody has to go identify Dominic can you please do it for me and of course he said yes and you know that his support is, was, and is, continues to be amazing. But that was it. And so I had to say over and over again, I have a psychology degree. So as I'm processing this information, I'm thinking, okay, how do I help people hear what I have to say? 
because I understood that shock can cause people to not actually hear what you're saying. And so I had to start off by saying, I have something terrible to tell you. Dominic is dead, you know, and I had to say it, you know, over and over and over again until I had reached the point at which I felt like I had given firsthand accounts to all the people that deserved a firsthand account. Yeah. And the rest of them could get it however they got it. So you went into crisis management role here or when did bereaved mother <laughs> kick in? <laughs> That's an interesting question because at first I remember, I remember several things, you know, obviously when I heard the news, I mean, I can remember just screaming and, you know, yeah. almost collapsing. Yeah in my foyer. And then I remember going to the sofa with the, with the sheriff's deputy, like I said, to confirm, but yeah, it was very much crisis management, but that's kind of who I am. And so I felt like I had to push off the feelings long enough. You know, I, I remember saying to the two children that were with me, I said, look, and they were adults too, by the way, I mean, these are not little kids. Right. I remember saying to them, cause one of the things that came back to me is how sometimes dead relatives are deified somehow, you know, they're perfect because, and that's something we can touch on later, but with sibling grief, but you know, that child can never do anything wrong again, you know, and then you, and you tend to put a glow on whatever memories you have of this person. Yeah. And I said to the two that were there, I said, Dominic is not going to become a saint. He's one of you. We're going to remember the good, the bad, the ugly and everything. And, um, and you guys don't mean any less just because he has died. And I, I remember actually saying that mm, to them. That's something. Yeah. Um, and then of course, then my husband, who was in California, which in all fairness, it was, you know, I mean, he was alone. So I had to make a flight for him. I had to, he was just, my husband just went totally to pieces and, I had to keep calling him, telling him what to put in his suitcase, telling him to get a ride to the airport, called his boss saying he's, you know, what happened. And so, yeah, for the most part, you know, I was the person who just had to, now my kids helped. I, I can't say that they didn't help. They really helped because my, my daughter did a lot of important work in getting things, you know, organized as we were going forward. And my oldest son, James Michael, he's made a lot like me. He's a very kind of take charge person. And so he did a lot of things that helped that helped move things along. But my husband really fell apart. So when you asked me, when did I transition to bereaved mother? I honestly don't. I was crying. I was upset. I was bereaved. I was sad. I was desperate. I can remember going up in my room. I made them get Dominic's pillows from his bed the next day from his apartment and bring them to me. And I remember burying my face in his pillows and just screaming but I didn't really get a chance to grieve, grieve until my husband, who stayed home for a number of months, went back to his job because there was just too much to do. Yeah. You had to push it off. Yeah. The idea of making the one who's been lost a saint, I've seen that, I have, almost to the, I wouldn't ca call it neglect, but... It, it it almost is like you got to be careful not to turn down the visibility of your other children in a case like that from what the times that I've tried to get into this water with bereaved parents. It's very damaging to surviving siblings. It's one of my passions yeah. is for parents to, I understand how in going forward and grieving the child that you've lost, that your resources are limited your ability to, you know, your mental, physical, psychological, spiritual resources are so limited because grief, it's like a, it's like a computer program running in the background. It's eating up your random access memory, yeah. which means it slows everything down. You have less to give and it's, and you can't help that. But at the same time, there are some practical things you can do such as not, you need to verbalize to your living children that they are not less important. There's a man named Nicholas Wolterstorff that wrote a book called Lament for a Son. And someone gave it to me right after Dominic died. And it was one of the most helpful books I've ever read. 
he's a theologian, he's a philosopher, and it's a it's a, an amazing book. It's little short chapters. That's another thing that when you're bereaved, your attention span is just shot. For most people, I haven't met anyone whose attention span doesn't just go into the wind. But anyway, he talked about that it's not that you love that child more, the missing child more. It's just that you have a different kind of relationship and a different kind of love for that child. But it's important to say these things. So many people don't say what they need to say. And I guess that's one of my big passions in talking about grief and whether it's child loss or any kind of grief is quit thinking that people know what you're thinking or feeling. Say it, say it. You need to actually say it. And if you can't say it with words, don't send a text, write it, (laughs) like actually literally write it, you know, and and tell, tell your kids, you know, I don't love you less. It's just that. I'm trying to process what it means to love a child that I can't hug anymore. That's that's really important. I, I, I think some newly bereaved parents need to hear that experience and, and understand that. I think that's, that's super important so that it, it doesn't create damage down the line that maybe could be mitigated at least to some degree mm-hmm. early on. Gosh, that's really a, a, a good insight. In talking to you beforehand, you had mentioned that you had a pretty rich faith going in. You talked about being a student of Scripture for a couple of decades prior to the accident. Yeah, I think probably around, let's see. Well, it's really interesting because it was it was uh, about a year or two before Dominic was born in 1990. So it'd be like 87, 88, 89. I really got very, very serious about Bible study. And this is back in the days when you didn't have the internet and you didn't have all these wonderful little helps that you can, you know, just Google now. Um, so I had an old Strong's Concordance and I had, you know, commentaries and all of these things. But my primary focus was on scripture itself. So one of the ways that I enriched my understanding of scripture was I'd read in different Bible translations, okay, you yeah. know, not, not paraphrases, although I do love paraphrases for some things, but actual translations. And so since I don't read Greek and I don't read Hebrew, that helped me to understand, a l- get a richer understanding of what verses meant. So at that time, I began reading through the Bible, the entire Bible. Didn't do it from Genesis to Revelation. I did it more just, you know, whatever book kind of came to me. And until I'd read the whole Bible. And that probably took, the first time I read through the Bible probably took me a couple years. And I, at that time, I also started a prayer journal and a Bible journal. And, and then at about, let's see, it was in 93, I think, um, I began to go to community Bible studies. And for those who don't know about this group, it's a, a wonderful group where they have Bible study lessons, but they focus on scripture, explaining scripture. It's not like these ones that are kind of personality led where that individual gives you their take on scripture. Mm -hmm. This is just straight scripture. And that began a real, just a passionate love for scripture in me. And as that continued, and also it was, it, you have these little discussion groups, you meet once a week and you have these discussion groups and people talk about their answers to the questions and there's no videos. That's the other thing too. It's not, it's not one of the video type things that are so popular now. So these were women and, and the groups were often made up of women who were more mature and less mature. And I was a young mother and it was wonderful to hear from people who had walked with the Lord for many more years than I had, and who also had different experiences than I had. And so anyway, that went on. And then I just did a lot of study. I taught Sunday school, and just that made me study more. And so you can move fast forward to Dominic was killed in 2014. So I think it was around 2011, And I realized that I had, you know, I'd read the Bible so many times, so many times, so many times. And I thought, you know, I'm going to slow down because it's, I can find myself getting to places in the Bible where I'm like, oh yeah, I've heard that story. And, um, 
it, like, I mean, yeah. you know, we, I'm yeah, just being know. honest. We all get it's there. It's so true. You know, that uh, slowing down thing is so cool when you do it. <laughs> yeah. And so I said, you know, I'm going to read one chapter a day. I'm not going to read any more than one chapter a day. I'm going to just start slow and read one chapter a day. And I'm going to really focus on one chapter. And so, um, again, I've been journaling. I'd been journaling for years. And I started out and my goal was I was going to copy out two or three verses from each chapter that really spoke to me and then, you know, write about my impressions, you know, for people who do Bible journaling, you kind of know that you know the drill. Well, as I started writing, I thought, you know, and let me back up. There had been times when I'd copied out whole books of the Bible, like one year I copied out all the Proverbs and, you know, another year I copied out several New Testament books. And so I thought, you know, I just, I can't pick one or two verses. So I started writing and I pretty much most days ended up writing out the whole chapter and uh, in longhand, not typing. So I had just finished going through the Bible that way and practically copying the entire Bible when Dominic died in April. I think I had finished in, I think it may have been January or February of that year. And so one of the things that that did was that it, it made scripture mine. I don't know if people are familiar, but it used to be in the biblical times, Old Testament times, that a young man would copy out large portions of scripture. Usually they were required to copy out the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, for them to be considered, you know, truly ready for their, bar, what we call bar mitzvah today, which means son of the law, um, for them to qualify for that. And there's something to be said for doing that. And so I know now that that was God's provision because right after Dominic died, even though, I mean, my Bible was still by my chair, I would open it occasionally to see, you know, one verse or another verse, but I could not, I just could not read it. Not because I was offended by it, but just because back to the attention thing and I was just too broken. I mean, I just couldn't do it, but all that scripture that was inside of me, you know, it would bubble up. And so my, my journals, right after Dominic died are filled with me with, you know, with the Lord, the Holy Spirit bringing certain verses to mind and me copying them out. And one of the things that I have done with verses for a long time, but was very, very prominent in the time immediately after Dominic's death was like expanding the verse. So say this is not one of the ones that really spoke to me, but, you know, be strong and courageous. So next to strong, I would write a bunch of synonyms for what does strong mean? Mm -hmm. Uh, Unmovable, uh, stalwart, brave. And so that was one of the ways that I was able to speak truth to my heart, even though it was broken and it, and I didn't, and it was hard to hear it sometimes, you know? So I know that that was God's provision, you know, and I'm very, I'm very passionate for, I'm passionate for people to understand what the Bible actually says Mm -hmm. and not what someone says it says. Yeah. I have many questions around that. And, you know, when going into that question, I was trying to steer it into, okay, so given your rich immersion in Scripture for a couple of decades, enough that it got so familiar that you had to make yourself do different things with it, which is a good place to be. It's a healthy place to be. You know, the question was, how did that impact your response? And what you're saying is you didn't just study Scripture. You had done things to bake in some of the really rich insights sort of into your DNA Mm -hmm. (laughs) such that when this happened, they were there. Right. They surfaced. They came to you. Mm -hmm. And it was God's provision that did that. That's the way you seem to view that. It is. And uh, we may get there as we continue to talk, I will say that I still had to pull things out because as human beings, we're going to put our own filter on what we read, whether it's scripture or anything else. And so as much as we would like not to. So when Dominic died, 
I had to pull everything out that I thought I understood and and expose it to the light of child loss, my experience mm-hmm. of child loss. So that's there was that. So I don't want to give anybody the impression because that was one of the reasons that I began the blog because I felt like there were so many stories of not just child loss, but all kinds of problems and, and challenges that people had faced as Christians where the stories were told in such a way that everything was tied up neatly with a beautiful little packaged bow and, oh, God is good. And I never questioned, or if I did, it was just briefly, you know, like maybe a minute or two. And, you know, and then I moved on because I know God is good. And the reality is, is I do know God is good. That night, another thing I, I told my kids, I had, um, In my living room, I had a bird feeder that was two hands and it was supposed to be, you know, God is God feeding the birds, you know, or the idea of provision. But the way I had always viewed that was it was like my hands open to God's provision. Instead of those being God's hands, they were my hands, you know. And I told the kids, I said, we can't accept um, the good things that God places in our hands and not also accept the hard things that he allows. And that I'm purposely saying allows as opposed to puts because that's a whole other theological concept that's important to me but I knew in my heart there's a quote from Julian of Norwich and she says and I actually shared this on Facebook the day that Dominic died the worst has happened yet all shall be well and all shall be well and it's, it's the idea is the worst, uh, no, the worst has happened and been mended, but all shall be well, all shall be well. And the idea being the very worst thing in history has already happened, which is that man sinned, deserved a death, Christ came, paid for it, and now we can have life if we believe in him. So that was the worst thing that ever happened. Dominic's death was the worst thing that ever happened to me. But it was not the worst thing that ever happened. And if God can mend the worst thing that ever happened, he can ultimately mend this. He will redeem and restore what has been taken. And so that part, that very fundamental truth, I never wavered from that. And I think that was that was the core of what I learned from all those years of of studying scripture. That is amazing. And and is so rich in insight and understanding of God's movement in your life throughout this whole thing. And I think that's something that bereaved parents can grab onto. And it's just really rich. I'm interested, and I don't want to sidebar on this too much. This may be a whole other conversation. What happened to speak? Spark this almost insatiable quest to understand Scripture and apparently deepen your own relationship with God? Well, it actually goes, well, let me back up. I think I've always, I was a very spiritually sensitive child, and I think that's just something that some people are and some people aren't and I can't really explain that and when I was in second grade I decided I was going to read the Bible then (laughs) in the King James Version I got to Leviticus and discovered that it was a little bit tough tough. (laughs) Leviticus is tough for a 40 year old man (laughs) Just a second yeah, grader, especially for a second grader. I can, I, I, I literally remember lying in my bed and thinking, "Man, I don't think I can read this." <laughs> um, but, um, but so I've always had this. I just, I just, I really think it was, you know, the Bible says that some people are given the gift of faith, and you know, in the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit are many and varied, and I just really feel like that my desire to read and understand scripture is a gift from God. And I I can't really explain it. I just know that as a young mom, that I was desperately hungry for a deeper walk, not in really a mysterious, mystical way, but well, let me back up. I think that I've always loved words too. And that's probably also a gift from God. And so the Bible to me was one of the richest pieces of writing, you know, with so much in it, 
and it covers so many years and it's such important writing that the combination of my spiritual sensitivity and my love of words, my desire to figure out how was I supposed to do this whole motherhood thing and frankly coming from a family that was a Christian family but not one that was deeply into like reading scripture and stuff like that. I mean, we went to church and Sunday school and stuff like that, but it was not, uh, if people had sat around now, my grandmother did, but if, but for the most part, if my immediate family had, um, sat around reading the Bible, they would have been like, you know, what are you doing? Yeah. So I don't know. It just all came together. And this is the thing. If you really give yourself to studying scripture, the more you do it, the more you want. You know, there's a place in Isaiah where, where God says, come eat, you know, to those who are thirsty, come drink. It's free to everybody. That's a rough, rough paraphrase. And it's like, why would you not come to this fountain? You know, when Jesus is with the woman at the well, I'll give you water, you know, living water, and you'll never thirst again. And it's true, you don't thirst in the same way. But you can't be quenched. Once you taste it, you really can't be quenched from this insatiable desire to have more. Yeah, you know? I, that's what, a thing that I, I think as I've matured in my faith and, and probably the thing that spurred me on as much as anything was that it is true that exists, that there exists a, an infinite creator God, infinite in goodness, intelligence, presence in all those ways. And he did create... And there's so much evidence to me that those things are in fact so. That if that's true, and he has, through people, communicated the way he designed things to work, and ultimately what's, gonna, what's, what's the point of it all? Mm-hmm. That he's revealed this, and that much of it is at our fingertips, how could we not view that thing, just that, just that concept alone, as by far the most important thing in your existence? And if it's at your fingertips, how can you not consume that as often and as much? I mean, it, it seems like you would almost need to get into a place where you had to pull yourself away from it to go eat and sleep. If if that fountain of life is ready to be poured into you and all it takes is a little effort on your part to go and discover, go and ask questions about this truth. And if you're not sure if it's the truth, at least get on this path of exploration to find out if it's not the truth or is the truth. Right. And I think that's probably where I've been over the last 10 years or so is in this search for truth and understanding, which won't end. It's not like, oh, I found the truth. Good. I'm, I, I've crossed the finish line. It's not that at all. It's that the more that that truth is revealed and you feel like you, you've gotten into a place of maturity where you have understanding and then you realize you haven't even scratched the surface. There's so much more in there. It sounds like that's kind of where you got to, and it, it just accelerated over time. Absolutely. And, it, and still the case? Yeah, I, w- I will be completely authentic and honest here. It was more difficult for me to do deep dives into Scripture since Dominic died. Mm-hmm. I still do. I still, as a matter of fact, I'm getting ready to start a Bible study with some other breed moms that we're going to do remotely. Yeah. And I've done several series on the blog where I've done some significant Bible study stuff and, you know, published out there. Sometimes it's harder now. Again, I think it's, it, it's not that I find scripture offensive. I'm still just as excited about it as I ever was. It's just that my attention span is very different. I used to, I was the kind of person that had six books going at one time, wherever I could possibly sit down. Right. I had a book in addition to scripture, 
reading. And um, I'm the kind of person that now it's very difficult for me to finish a whole book. It has to have short chapters and I'll sometimes forget things. And that's a whole thing about grief brain. What grief does to you, it, it literally physically changes your brain. Really? Mm-hmm. So. Well, don't you think you also kind of get into seasons as well? God, God puts you in places in certain times where maybe one particular approach or or path is mm-hmm. heightened and, and intensified and, and you whether it be an immersion in scripture or you know I've gone through seasons and and probably in am in a little season now where I want to understand why unbelievers don't believe and so I I bookend it with my own prayer and scripture and that sort of thing but I, I'm reading books and articles that are aggressively atheist right and and I think that's true. And that's just a season, right? Yeah, I and, think and, that's true. And I, I've been in other seasons, and, and I feel like maybe that's probably what's going on here. It's interesting that you were in that season of really deep immersion such that you're almost literally rewriting, or not rewriting, but copying mm-hmm. the Scripture as you are deepening your existence and, and understanding of Scripture. And so it sets you up to be in a place where God kind of swooped in and and gave you comfort in the worst thing. He did, and, and he's faithful to do that. And I guess my part of where I am now is exploring the mystery between what we can know and what we can't know. And while I am a firm believer, as you can tell in scripture, and that there's so much in scripture that tells us who God is and how he works in the world and, and what he wants from us and how we can walk worthy of the calling of Christ. I do think that especially the Western church tends to minimize that gap between what he has revealed about himself, even through Christ, who in Colossians, it says is the exact representation of, of the father between what we can know and what we will never know until eternity. And I think that I'm in that space now. I'm, I'm very comfortable living in that mysterious space. I think that's eventually where most people who've suffered traumatic loss have to get to because there's just a lot of unanswered questions. Yeah, and the question I would have is about your response early on and how did that, how did your interaction with God, and I'm assuming... I'm assuming that as you're going into this deeper pre-event time where you're immersed in Scripture, that you're also in prayer. I mean, I, mm-hmm. this is an ongoing relation, deepening relationship with God, or is this just being a student of Scripture? No, no, no. It was absolutely my journals are, right. you know, I would copy out and then it would be a combination of prayer in the sense of how we tend to think of prayer, which is asking from or talking to God and prayer also in the sense which this is also kind of a little bit more toward the mystical than what sometimes Western churches are comfortable with, but hearing (laughs) from, hearing from God, you know, hearing from God. So frequently, and that's one thing, it's funny, Fred, one time when we, when we knew one another early on, he says, you sound like you were taught by, you know, like you had a father that taught you, taught you about scripture. And I said, I did. And he says, and he started asking me about my dad. I said, oh no, it was the Holy Spirit. It was my heavenly father, because that is really, I am a big, big believer in approaching scripture or prayer or anything and just trusting, you know, Jesus said when he was leaving, he says to his disciples, he says, it's better for you that I go. And he, and you can just imagine the faces around the table yeah, like, what? what do you mean, dude? <laughs> you know, but he says the the spirit will come and he will lead you into all truth because the Holy Spirit's ministry to us, the third parson of the Trinity, his ministry is to lead us into truth, to bring us to understanding. Because think of how many times Jesus gave parables and the disciples came up to him afterwards and says, I know you were talking about this, but I'm not really sure what you meant, (laughs) you know, but the Holy Spirit, we're promised. And, you know, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was given to people, but it could also be taken away, which is why David prays. He says, let not your spirit be taken from me like it was from Saul. And now as believers in Christ, 
The Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us. That's what makes us temples of God. Not us. It's the Spirit in us. Oh, gosh, to have a conversation about the Holy Spirit is, <laughs> um, is so good. I spoke with uh, a lady a couple weeks ago, and she works with people on the presence of God and what the Holy Spirit is and and the power that comes with that. I think non-believers think that's one of the silliest things they can imagine. And from their perspective, I can understand that. I really, I really can. But until you're in the game, until you have participated, until you go looking after, ask for, participate with the Holy Spirit, you, you just can't understand it. You can't. And it's, as someone who is reasonably coherent, I hope, I have experienced it. And I, all I can say to somebody who thinks it's a silly thing is, I've been where you are, so I've been there, and, and now I'm here, and it's real. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know it sounds crazy, but it's a real thing, and it's a real deal, and it's a promise that we have that we can ask for mm-hmm. and and get and you may just have to come back and we just spend time talking about the Holy Spirit <laughs> stuff because it's, it is true and it's amazing. And I think, I don't think people get it. And I, and I think they get a little uneasy about this Holy Spirit thing. And, and it almost sounds silly and fairy ish And I understand that, but it's truth. It is true. And we could literally talk here for hours and hours, but that's one of the things that I've learned to pray for, for people, especially post post my loss. I prayed for it before, but now it's the first thing I pray for for people is that wherever they are, whatever they're experiencing, whether they are believers or unbelievers, is that they will feel and experience the presence of God in their situation because that is the most powerful comfort and peace and truth. And if they can feel that, if they can allow God to penetrate whatever defenses they have put up, he will be, he, he's always there, but he won't force in if people refuse to allow him to. That's right. And that's always my prayer for anybody before healing, before anything is that they will experience the presence of God. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I, I pray that too. When, when I see these prayer requests on social media or whatever, it's like, Please, and someone's sick or or something happens, and they say, please pray for complete healing. My initial response is, no. (laughs) I'm not going to go to God and ask for complete healing because it's not the most important thing. And it may not even be his will for that particular situation. That's right. And that's I may get to that in my prayer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it will not be the first thing I pray Mm -hmm. for. I will pray for his presence. Mm -hmm. I will pray that they move closer to him. That's what matters, Mm -hmm. and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And if those things happen, it doesn't matter if they recover or not. Right. It's all good. And I also would say that the chances of healing taking place once the Holy Spirit is present probably go up. (laughs) So I think that's just the groundwork that needs to get laid there. This is such rich insight on the presence of the Holy Spirit. I think one of the things that you, a point you made a second ago also is important in that when we read in Acts the events that took place at, at Pentecost and even throughout Acts as the Holy Spirit is being given in mm-hmm. other places as people are being baptized into the gospel of Christ, Paul even goes to, to one group and they had been baptized They said that they had been baptized into the gospel of John, which was just the baptism of repentance. They didn't understand Christ. And so they're like, we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. That was literally their response, which is like, what? And okay, well, that's interesting. And then he taught them about Christ, and then they were baptized and Mm -hmm. received the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And throughout Acts, especially Acts, it, it sounds like it's a one-time event. It's like, oh gosh, we got the Holy Spirit, so we're good. And 
what I found and what I, I, I believe and what you said just a second ago was so interesting and good is that just because we received him once doesn't mean that it's always there. We can kind of give him the boot unintentionally, and at least so he is not stirring within us. I find that I pray for the Holy Spirit with frequency. I ask him to fill me with it almost on a daily basis. I think we can quench the Spirit. I would argue from a theological point of view as revealed in the New Testament that the Holy Spirit is, you know, it's called the earnest money or down payment on our salvation. I think that's in Corinthians that Paul says that. So I don't think we lose the Holy Spirit like he could be lost in the Old Testament. He could be removed from believers in the Old Testament. But I do believe that we can quench his actions in our lives. I think we have to be participants with and welcoming to him for him to be able to move freely in our lives and, and lead us to the truth. We can refuse to go. Um, I am a shepherd and don't have a lot of goats and sheep anymore, but I did at one time had like 50. And, um, you know, I would sometimes, all the little animals would go in a row and they'd follow me wherever I was going, just like in the 23rd Psalm, he leads us into, you know, green pastures and yeah. still waters. And, but there would be some that just were not going to come, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. <laughs> and um, I, that's how I view it. I feel like, like that we can refuse to follow. We can refuse to allow him freedom to reign in our, in our hearts and our lives. And so I do think that we need to request his presence and request that he teach us and that we be teachable. So I think that's really important. And I think people, again, this is, you know, certain denominations, certain faith traditions, they're less or more attuned to this idea. But the Bible clearly teaches that that's the that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit on our lives to help us pray, help us help lead us into truth and help guide us in ways that just reading the Bible, so to speak, is it going to, I mean, there's not a, there's not a map in here for what I'm supposed to do tomorrow, Mm -hmm. you know, when I get up, but I can, but the spirit will lead me if I let him just like uh, he led Paul to different places at different times. How do you feel like you experienced the presence of God in and through the early days I think, like I said, initially what you said, you know, about me being stepping back, but I know that that even there was the grace of God for me to be able to make the phone calls, to be able to think, to realize that they had, that even the words I had to give to people had to be framed in a certain way. I mean, at that point it had been, might might have been 30 years since I'd graduated So I don't know why, I mean, unless God brought all those things to my mind, there was no reason for me to be thinking of those things. That was stuff I had studied years and years and years ago. And then through God's people, like, um, you know, like Fred, his, you know, his gracious, gracious response, I woke him up. It was like, by the time I called him, I think it was five or something in the morning. And um, his gracious response, the response of, even Dominic's friends, who not all of them are believers or were believers at the time, but they were just came and supported and people that came and people that brought things and people that filled needs that I didn't, I mean, I had never planned a funeral. I didn't know anything. You don't think you're going to plan your child's funeral. We didn't have a a burial plot. That was one ex- one example, which a lot of bereaved parents, you don't have a bear unless you, unless you're part of a kind of an old school community where you maybe because you belong to a church for a long time, you have family burial plots. There's a church up the road from us a mile from our house and um, they had a graveyard. And I, all I could think of at the time was Dominic can't be far from me. And at this point in my life, I, and this many years past, it's, not as big a deal to me, but at the time, all I could think of was I can't bury my child where I have to go a great distance to see him. And it was also very important to me that he be buried in a church cemetery. That's just a personal thing. Um, cause that's where my family has always been married in different church cemeteries. And, um, I didn't even know who to call. I didn't know how to find out if I could get a burial plot there. And 
through multiple people who knew somebody who knew somebody. And anyway, it was all worked out. And, um, you know, there was just a lot of details that were handled, even up to and including someone who has never lost a child sent me that book, Lament for a Son. She just mailed it to me. And it turned out to be one of the most important things I read in the first couple of weeks. I never felt... I never felt like God wasn't there. I guess that would be one of the most important things because I know some people do feel like God isn't there when something bad like this happens to them, even if there are believers. I can't say that I had some supernatural, you know, there's also people that'll say, well, I just had this amazing peace come over me. That did not happen. <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry. I mean, I'm just going to be honest. But I didn't feel like God had abandoned me. I knew he was there. Yeah, don't we get to choose how we see in some cases? So the same thing could happen to one parent where they are unable to recognize that as the presence of God. And other parents that see that somehow in this whirlwind where I... I don't even remember half of it. All these things got taken care of. And I don't believe that to be coincidence. I believe that's God's presence. Do we get to play a part in that, in the way we choose to see, whether we choose to see God or whether we choose to not see God? I think we do. I think part of that, I would say there's two parts to that. One is some people are predisposed to be grateful, thankful, recognize the hand of God. And, and it can be for a number of reasons. It can because of, be because of past experience. It can even be because they had a wonderful parent, uh, you know, had wonderful parents growing up. So they don't have any reason to doubt the goodness of their heavenly father because their earthly father was, was very easy to believe in. You know, my dad is, is a person that I always felt confident in. So it doesn't even occur to me that my heavenly father would be unworthy of my love. So sometimes past experience will predispose a person one way or the other. And then I think too, a lot of it, quite frankly, has to do with what kind of teaching they've sat under. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think, I feel like we have a, a real predilection in many of our churches for there to be something called sunshine Christianity, which is, you know, put a nice face on it and plaster a Bible verse across it. And, you know, I'm too blessed to be stressed, yeah. you know, and, but the reality is, is that's not true. When, especially when something like child loss happens, you feel what you feel. And when we teach people in Sunday school and through sermons that if they feel something other than jubilation over whatever their circumstances are, or that by pretending to feel jubilation, they can somehow magically change their circumstances, we are lying to them. Yeah. God has made us as of beings we feel, we think, and our feelings are not wrong. They just are feelings. Now, whether we act on them or not, you know, it's like being married. If you're married, you've made a commitment to a certain relationship and a certain direction for your life. Now, you may feel attracted to another individual, but you don't act on those feelings, hopefully, because of the prior commitment. But we feel what we feel. And when people argue with another person's feelings like they don't matter, especially something as profound as child loss or really any traumatic loss, it doesn't have to just be child loss. People don't know what to do with that. And so I think sometimes that's why they get confused about the presence of God because they're feeling terrible. So if they feel this bad and they've been taught that if they only have faith, if they only have a right relationship with God, if they only believe the correct things, they shouldn't be feeling this way. Mm, yeah. Well, what's the alternative? Well, I must not have a right relationship with God or God has left me or you know, I'm forsaken or whatever. And that is a very, very damaging teaching. Yeah. And I would think you, you may have even encountered some who have been taught that maybe it's the result of some sort of punishment even. Oh, absolutely. Or lack of faith. Yeah. And back to your comments on healing is, 
I can't tell you the number of parents that I know whose children fought long battles with some form of disease or illness or had an accident and they seemed like they were recovering and then they didn't recover. And people that imply that because their child was not healed, that they either lacked faith or there was some sin or something. And that is just, oh my goodness, that is so painful and so wrong. That is not what the Bible teaches. You know, when there was a blind man and the disciples or the Pharisees, whoever came to him and says, you know, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his sin or his parents' sin? Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, neither. It was so that the glory of God could be shown. We don't know. And that goes back to my idea of mystery between what we know right now and what we can't know until eternity. I don't know why some people are healed and some people aren't. I don't know why my son was killed and other people might have a similar accident and not die. I have no idea. But it is not for somebody else to explain it to me and speak on God's behalf. Yeah, I think when we get into the business of trying to explain why, why, <laughs> why, and let's, let's just picture this here, an intelligence that is infinite in scope and the potential of what that intelligence, that being, that person can do and see. Our microscopic brains have no chance of ever explaining why God does anything. And people have asked me, and non-believers, why, why do you do that? And I'm like, <laughs> it's so far out of my pay grade. I'm never going to be able to explain why. I just know that if his intelligence is infinite, that it will be okay. And, and I equate it to my three-year-old trying to understand where babies come from. All I can tell them is like, hey, look, or, or, or even probably better when they have to go get their shots mm-hmm. at the doctor. I, I can't explain that to them. They won't ever understand it. All that it looks like is I'm complicit in their torture. Correct. And, uh, and, and the gap between their intelligence and, and mine is so small compared mm-hmm. to the gap in intelligence. So anyway, yeah, that's a, that's a thing. And so this whole notion of seeing God as a God of condemnation I think people have been taught that, and I don't know if that is just a holdover from a time in our culture where scaring people toward faith was in vogue. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. But when I read the Bible, and I've read it many times, I read the places where he talks about being a jealous God and some of the things that he did in the Old Testament— and the, the, the more I read those things, the less I see him as a vindictive God. I just I, I get to where I see that those actions less as a, a ticked off God who has uh, lost control of his emotions and deciding to wipe people out because he's mad. Mm-hmm. And more of, <laughs> it sounds crazy, love. I remember talking to someone, actually, it was, I think you've had Mac Ogren on before. Yeah, I have, early and, on. Yeah, he and I were talking, uh, we were at church one day, and I don't remember how this came up, but I said, you know, a lot of people view Christianity and the invitation to believe in Christ as there's all these pious people on a boat in the middle of the ocean, sort of like some of the the pictures you see of Noah and the ark, which is what made me think of it just now. And it's like people are reaching up, trying to climb on the boat and everybody on the boats, you know, kicking them and saying, no, you can't get on. You can't get on. You're not righteous (laughs) enough. But that's the wrong picture. It's not a boat that's limited to certain people in the sense of, you know, it's only got room for so many. It's everybody's already drowning. Everybody is already in the ocean. Everybody's already doomed. And God and his grace and his mercy and his love has provided a vehicle for them to be saved. And all they have to do is reach a hand up out of the water and say, can I get on the boat? That's right. And he says, sure, let me help you up. 
And that's, yeah, that's good. it's the it's not it's the opposite of what most people think. They think that it's, you know, exclusive. And it is exclusive in the sense that God has provided a single way, or if you want to use my analogy, a single boat. But the boat is continually expanding it whoever wants to get on it can get on it there's no pre-qualifications other than to say i want to be on the boat that's great and -hmm. otherwise you're going to drown anyway i mean you're already drowning you just may you may not realize it because you're so far you've been able to tread water but you're drowning anyway god put the boat in the water got on the boat and is reaching his hand out and all you have to do is reach up and grab it exactly or you can refuse to grab it correct and And it's up to survive yourself yeah but it's up to you whether you do it or not yeah, the notion of a condemning God is something that we gotta, we as Christians have to work harder at dispelling that notion because it is a misrepresentation of the truth. It is a misrepresentation of love, and that is the reputation, unfortunately, that Christianity has developed, and people can grab the worst in people of faith and point to it and and have their evidence for it. And it's just not the truth. So Christians have to be better, I believe, at dispelling that that notion. We talked about the blog. You started writing and blogging shortly after Dominic's passing, and the name of the blog is The Life I Didn't Choose. And I think from my talking to you is just something you decided to start doing. And you began to express the truth about how you felt and what the world of being a bereaved parent is. You express the truths of who God is in a lot of that too. Mm-hmm. So... I last looked, there's a little counter on, and it's somewhere between three and four million people have, or views have taken place. I'll, I'll click on any random article on there, and I, after I get through reading it, I scroll to the bottom, and Facebook alone is 2,000 shares. And so your blog has turned into a thing. And, and so when we're referencing that, you have immersed yourself in what appears to be a ministry that has stemmed from your own grief. Talk about what the blog has become for you. I wrote the first blog post in September of 2015, so it was close to a year and a half after Dominic died. And to be honest, I kind of started it because there's this... There's this thing that happens after loss, and it's not just child loss, it's loss in general, that people give you a certain amount of time to kind of, you know, boohoo and talk about things. And then not really most of the time through any fault of their own. It's just that they see your loss as a point in time. It's a date on the calendar, and they don't recognize that it's a daily Uh, experience for the person who's experienced who's had the loss and so at a year and a half I mean my goodness my family wasn't even close to having processed what had happened Mm. much less quote-unquote moving on from it they view it as a, a, a like a wound on your arm that given a certain amount of time it should be healed by now exactly Mm, and and in fairness, you know, I I wouldn't have said that I understood this that early on, but now years later, I understand why that happens. I understand why people respond that way, because if they haven't experienced a profound loss, then they just, I mean, they just can't get it. They just don't get it. And, And it doesn't mean that they can't educate themselves, which I'll get to, which is part of the point of the blog, but it does mean experientially they don't get it. So I started writing it in part because friends and family, I could tell there were things that they didn't understand about my experience and about my family's experience. And I kind of wanted them to know. And that combined with the idea, which I mentioned before, of the stories that I found for the most part, except for two or three books or things that I'd read, 
just really tied everything up neatly. It was like, yeah, I was sad for a while, but you know, now it's okay. And I'm thinking, well, there's got to be something wrong with me because it ain't okay yet. Yeah. And I don't see it's going to get okay anytime soon. And I could just see all the ripple effects throughout my family. I had three adult children and I could see how it was impacting, continuing to impact them and my marriage and my family and my husband and even my parents and, you know, just all kinds of things. And so I started writing and it surprised me. I mean, I had no, I'm, if you go on my blog, you'll find that there's no bells and whistles. It's pretty simple, but it surprised me that people started reading it. And as I began to write and kept writing. I mean, we were talking about the Holy Spirit. I mean, God just brought topics and there it's not all about it's not all about my relationship with Christ. A lot of it's just boots on the ground stuff. You know, it's about what does what does grief look like? What are some of the physical manifestations of grief? I've mentioned about grief brain, you know, losing your attention span, forgetting things, thinking you're literally going crazy. The first six months of grieving Dominic, I had to write an index card every day with simple things like feed the animals, take the trash out, you know, simple, eat breakfast. I could, Mm. I couldn't remember anything. So as it went on and I began to get feedback at first, I wrote occasionally. And then in, I guess it was November of 2015, because a lot of people do the days of gratitude thing. I thought, well, I'll try to write something every day. And I did, and I was surprised that I could do it. And since then, I have published a blog every single day since November 1 of 2015. And um, some of them are reposts. It depends. You know, I, I don't write fresh every day. My husband retired recently, so that has eaten into my my writing time. <laughs> it's different. You know, what are somebody's, you doing here? <laughs> somebody's there 24-7 now. And and sometimes the, the topics are a function of what's going on exactly in my life. Um, sometimes it's a function of uh, I'm in closed bereaved groups on Facebook and topics will come up. And I just see that parents are struggling. And I just feel like, well, we need to give words to that. We need to we need to to round that out. And one of the things I also decided earlier on because of the short attention span of, of most bereaved parents is I thought, well, this, I am not going to write long dissertations on anything. There's a few that are longer because they cite some evidence or something like that. But for the most part, they're kind of short, uh, snappy. I usually have a personal anecdote and then I add something to it and have a, a very simple plain point to most of them but um, what has happened is I get a lot of feedback where parents are say you know this first thing I look for in the morning which I don't say that to my own credit I'm just saying that it it has become a ministry yes. because I know that there's people that when they get up in the morning they want to see it and even if the topic that day doesn't really fit where they are at the moment they know that there's somebody out there who is walking the path the same as they are and they're not alone yeah i think you would i think it would be natural to feel crazy alone it yes you do and and this is the thing even within your own grief circle so my husband lost a son i lost a son but his relationship to my to our son is filtered through his personality, our son's personality, their shared experiences. Mine is shared is through my personality, our son's personality, and our shared experience. And they're not all the same. And so every person, even within your grief circle, is experiencing the grief of the same of the loss of the same of the same individual in different ways. And so, you know, siblings. Dominic was the middle boy. Um, he and my oldest daughter are my daughter, who's the oldest, they had a unique relationship because they both liked some of the same things. But then the three boys had a relationship because they were all boys. And then the two youngest had a relationship because they were only 19 months Absolutely, apart. Absolutely, yeah. It's just all different. Mm-hmm. So yes, you feel very alone. Man, the blog is so impactful. I, I found myself getting lost in there a few times just because I would click on the next one and I would get into the reading of the comments and... I I am not a bereaved parent, but I can clearly see the importance of what you're doing and the fact that it has turned into a ministry for you that was born out of probably the worst thing that's ever happened in your life 
and hopefully will ever happen in your life. And it happens like that Mm -hmm. sometimes. That's one of the things I keep quoting Fred, but it's funny because he has these little, as you all know, if you've known Fred for very long, he has these little phrases that he develops. And one of his, one of his is your misery becomes your ministry. Yeah. And I've always remembered that because it's uh second Corinthians, we comfort others with the comfort we ourselves have received. And it absolutely has become a ministry. So now, you know, I think uh, when we had spoken earlier before we had this, this on air interview, we were, you asked me, you know, am I consumed with grief? You know, mm-hmm. like, and I'm not, I function at a high level in our, you know, in, in life, I'm, I'm not constantly boohooing about our son. There's days when it happens and it can be, it can be on milestone days or it can be just random. Like today driving in, I passed many, many, many places that our family has a lot of memories of. And it, it caught me by surprise because I haven't felt that in a mm-hmm. while, but I do think about grief every day. Yeah. Yeah. Because this is my ministry. Yeah, that was the question. I think it came from that because I'm reading your blog and it's not like I would see something once a month or once a week or whatever. It was every day. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I wonder, is is Melanie just continued it, it seven and a half, nearly eight years later? Is she still living in relentless agony? I mean, I know that you don't recover and grief is the wound stays there and Mm -hmm. but the truth is some of that's probably the case but but it has turned into purpose right right and 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 you believe you clearly have been given a gift of being able to take feelings and turn them into words and articulate them such that people going through similar situations can feel the community and the love that comes from other people that that share that with them. Right. And I have had, you know, it hasn't just been bereaved parents. I have one good friend who experienced a traumatic ministry issue through no fault of their own. And there was no sin involved. It was just a a church brouhaha thing that happened. And she said, you know, I know I haven't lost a child, but I can just, I, the, I identified with the grief and the process of going through dealing with the pain and that kind of stuff. I have another friend who suffers from post-traumatic stress from a abuse situation. And she said the same thing. So I think grief is a, we don't like to think about it, but it is a universal experience of the human condition. I think so. Yeah. yeah. I, I, it's going to happen. It's practically guaranteed for every every one of us that walks on the planet at some point or another. And loss is loss. And mm-hmm. I, I believe personally, and I have not gone through it, but just in my observations, the loss of a child is probably the most extreme loss that can take place. And so I think people would naturally be able to go to a place where people are talking in terms of that extreme loss and still be able to very much relate the things they feel, the pain they feel as it applies to their situation, though it may not be the loss of a child. You've been doing it for seven, almost seven years now. Mm -hmm. I guess you were... It'll be seven in September. Yeah, so I would imagine that you've encountered some new things or some things that you didn't experience, but that you kind of were able to get into somebody else's water. I know what you mean. For example, Dominic didn't buy, die by suicide. And I've had, yeah, I've had conversations with parents who children did die by suicide. And, um, that actually, I've addressed that a couple times. I'm very careful when I, speak to another's experience. But one, I know one blog post I published on suicide was the a parent, another parent gave me her permission to use her words. And I used her words and talked about how, because one of the misconceptions in the, in Christianity, according to some traditions is that suicide means that you can't go to heaven. Right. Um, 
it's pretty much been, it's not taught as heavily anymore, but it's kind of one of those myth sort of things that hang out there. And some parents are just so upset and they're so concerned about that. Um, so this was a parent, she had used scripture to talk about all the different ways that, that God has clearly provided, even in suicide, if someone has made a confession of faith, that they, that suicide does not disqualify them from heaven. You right. Know? Um, so I've, I've addressed some of those issues I haven't really gone very much into parents who've lost a child through disease because that's not my experience, although I have touched on the fact that it has its own particular kind of trauma, just like sudden death has its own kind of trauma. I mean, if a child, you lose a child to disease, hopefully you spend some of that time saying your goodbyes and doing the kinds of resolving some of the things that we would all like to resolve before someone we love leaves this earth. Um, whereas with sudden death, you know, Dominic was supposed to come over Saturday morning. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, we had one specifically here, Lori Evans, that her son Noah, and, and I try to communicate with him periodically, uh, just out of nowhere, 13 years old, 12, about to be 13 at the time, developed a brain tumor in they had a lot of time together, but in that time, she basically had to watch him be mm-hmm. tortured. And that's horrible. So it wasn't a quick thing. Mm-hmm. It was a, it, and, and to hear the things that she saw this precious child have to endure on his way out for just seeming like, you just can't. It's uh, horrific. That that kind of stuff, I just, I have a hard time. And I can imagine that you get, at least some of a lot of different scenarios from all of that. What are you, what are some of the early things that you say to especially newly bereaved parents when they are uh, just completely submerged in that relentless agony that you can't seem to escape and doesn't look like will ever give you relief from what you've experienced and what you've learned through others' experience by immersing yourself into the grief community mm-hmm. like you have, what do you say to somebody in that place? The first thing I tell them is that it's not going to get better for a while. And I think that's just so important because I think what people outside the grief community want to tell people, mainly because they hope it's true, because they hope if grief comes through their door, that it'll be the truth, but it's just not. Um, They hear a lot of, you know, it's going to be okay. It's going to get better. And the reality is it's not for a good long time. It's not going to get better. It's probably actually going to get worse because once that fog kind of lifts and you begin to recognize the thousands of ways there are to miss your child and the, the thousands of ways for your heart to be pricked, as you begin to realize the things that they're never going to do, that they're, you're never going to get to see them do, it gets worse. But I do tell them that with God's help, with remaining open, like we were saying, to the Spirit's work in your life, with remaining open to the presence of God and how He may bring help and comfort and aid to you through other people, through His Word, through a book that may not even, it may not even be a Christian book, just just knowing that someone else is experience, has experienced the same thing as you have. Get involved in a bereaved parent community. There's so many online in Facebook. And I know not I know Facebook's not the most popular thing anymore, but it's a wonderful way. You don't have to do anything else on Facebook but have a profile and do, you know, some of these bereaved parent communities where you can it they're closed, they're only bereaved parents. You can say what you want to, you can you can express what you need to, and you'll get encouragement. To me, I I will just, this is an aside, but the bereaved parent communities I've been part of, especially the ones that are focused on uh, their Christian bereaved parent groups, that is how the church is supposed to work. Yeah, People don't shout each other's down. They don't shush each other. They just, they're just loving and considerate and comf- and they comfort one another and they encourage one another. So that I would say that. And then the final thing is, is this is your journey. It's going to be different for you than it is for anybody else. Nobody else has the relationship that you had with your child. Nobody else had the experience that you had with your child's death 
and you're, we all bring our own baggage to grief. So how we grew up, how we've experienced prior grief events, there's just so much that goes into how you end up grieving. So be authentic with yourself, be honest with yourself, be as honest as you can be with the people around you. And then it's literally just, I mean, it is literally one breath, one moment, one step at a time. And only do what you can do. And then for those who are believers, I always tell them, you know, surround yourself with truth because you may not be able to, your heart may not be ready to hear it, but if you keep the truth in front of you, eventually it's going to, you know, you'll be able to receive it again. And so honestly, I just feel like a lot of it is, is letting parents know that what they're experiencing is normal and that it being hard is normal and that wondering if you're going to make it is normal. But the reality is, is that for the vast majority of parents, we do make it, you know, it's like that thing, you know, I could never survive this. Well, you really don't have a choice. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you literally do. I mean, you could take your own life, but there's very, very few that would do that. Yeah. And people, People, people do get in those places mm-hmm. and at least wrestle with that it oh. often and uh absolutely you're a spiritual person you feel like you have had sensitivity to the spiritual life and i see it and i think it's good and as a spiritual person you i, I think that we usually believe that there's purpose in mm-hmm. things and in true God fashion, it's probably multi. It's probably way in beyond what we could imagine. But what do you think is the purpose of grief? I honestly think that the purpose of grief is to strip us of the sense that we are in control. I think, you know, just like Satan said, I will ascend to the throne of the Most High, and pride is the ultimate, it's the root of, of what I, of most sins, if not all sins. I think that when we lose something or someone that is so important to us, that we are face to face with the idea that we are not the masters of our own fate. That grief is the ultimate stripping away of everything that we thought we could count on in ourselves. And it is the ultimate humiliation. I remember when we were praying before we had Dominic's visitation, that we were in a circle praying and I just had this unbelievable need to drop to my knees, and I did. And I remember thinking, you know, I'm in the dust. I'm made of dust, and I'm in the dust. Nothing else could possibly happen to me that would be worse than this. And since then, I know that that's true. I mean, obviously, I could lose another child, and I know parents that have, and I pray that's a constant prayer that I not have to do that. But people, you know, people say things or they want to do something to me or they think they can offend me or whatever. And I just, I just inside, because like I said, grief has stripped it all away. It's like, there's nothing you can do to me. You literally cannot do anything to me. You cannot offend me. You cannot, which is not to say that I never get offended or upset. I mean, I'm human, you know, but for the most part, I am so abased and so low in my spirit mm-hmm. and not not sad but but meaning that I don't I I don't know how it's like um I think it's Richard was it Richard Foster somebody anyway it says humility is not thinking less of yourself it's thinking of yourself less mm-hmm. and that's what grief has done to me it's it's to, I'm to a place where I feel like whatever God chooses to do I'm okay with it because he's God and I'm not. 
And I don't know, maybe maybe that's what grief is for. Yeah, and places us in proper position relative to him. Maybe I'm, I'm yeah. Because I also I feel that same feeling of where I, I just want to get like under the carpet. Mm-hmm. It just because I want to get in the right mm-hmm. position versus where he is. I feel that sometimes even when really good, great things happen. Mm-hmm. Because you're overwhelmed. It's my cup overflows. Yeah. Yeah. And I and don't deserve humbled it. humbled and just like humility. It's mm-hmm. like, get down, man. <laughs> this is so This is so over your head. And I also think it levels the playing field with other humans. You know, we like to, we like to we're constantly into one-upmanship. And I think maybe yeah. that's why when I said that the bereaved parent groups operate like I would I wish the whole church operated. We could learn some stuff there. You know, yeah. we're we're all leveled out. We've all hit the bottom. And, you know, I don't have anything to hold over you and you don't have anything to hold over me. And if we if we share an insight, it's it's done with humility and kindness and like, you know, well, this is my experience, you know, but it might not work for you. And there's no throwing scriptures at each other trying to, you know, it's what my daughter calls the Jesus juke, which is, which is, <laughs> which is, you know, somebody you get on Facebook and you, and somebody shares something and then somebody goes, well, actually they share this little verse and it's, it's, it's sort of like they're trying to comfort you, but really they're trying to correct you, you know? Yeah. And there's that for the most part it's doesn't go on. Cringe, you yeah. know? Oh. <laughs> but it, but I, I just think, you know, when Paul talks in Second Corinthians and he says, you know, we were pressed and crushed and, you know, but not destroyed. That verse actually was given to me in another hard season of my life before Dominic died. But that is just, that's what I think. I think about that. I think, you know, we're so low and he says, and yet we have this message, this gospel in jars of clay. Why are they in jars of clay? So that the glory of the message shines forth and not the vessel through which it's delivered. And that's what grief does. I guess I should have said that to begin with, but that's what grief does. It proves to me that I'm a jar of clay. Yeah. And anything I have to share is by the grace and gl- and for the glory of God. And it's not because, you know, I mean, I do feel like God has gifted me with the ability to use words in a way that communicate truth, but it's his gift to me to be used for his glory. Yeah. And I feel like sometimes our, our full investment is of right now. And if we would, when we begin to see things, try to see things from more of an eternal perspective versus all my chips are in on the right now, all my chips are in on my career, all my chips are in on my children, all my chips are in on my spouse or our lifestyle or whatever the right now is. And, and children can be an idol, mm-hmm. often are an idol as well. And I don't think it's God punishing us for having an idol when something like this happens. But I think that when tragedy strikes, that God moves us into a space where we can get in right position for our own good because there's a longer term picture. The story's not over yet. It seems like the story's over. It seems like life has ended, but there's just a bigger picture. Mm-hmm. Do you see it that way? I do. I think that, um, I think that's one of the tragedies to me. It's the greatest tragedy when something like this happens and people don't allow the presence of God to indwell their loss and their grief and their valley and they don't follow the shepherd and they don't let him lead them to the green pastures and still waters because then it's wasted. To me, that's the worst tragedy of all. Yeah, It would be more tragic to me than losing Dominic if it was wasted. And what's to come is the idea of redemption in scripture is so powerful. And I think, again, in today's society in general, we don't recognize what redemption really means. We don't understand that we belonged to God, but it was like it was as if someone had stolen what was his and pawned it. And then he went back and paid the pawn ticket to get back what 
what was his already. It was right. already his. Mm-hmm. And in today's litigious society, I don't think we really think about what that means to not argue over whether it's your whether whether we belong to him or not. We did belong to him. We do belong to him. But he had to pay a price in order for us to be in full complete relationship with him again. And the price was higher than any of us would have paid. I wouldn't have given my son for anybody else. And I'm just going to be quite frank with about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you no, know, none of us would, I don't you think. know. And so, but that's the, that's the greater tragedy to me yeah. is when pain is wasted throughout this whole thing. I mean, this is a, it's a faith based podcast and the conversations we have are, specifically to point people toward Christ, but as the skeptic, I like to try to portray or at least ask questions of those who are skeptical. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you a question that I hope to ask more people. Everything that you responded to about this is related to its place in relation to God and eternity and those kinds of things. And you had this spirit in you from a very early age if you had some sort of idea that you were going to read the bible in the second grade and then the things that you've done throughout your life it doesn't and and i don't know you may have had places in your life where you were you had really put faith on the line and just to see if it was true but what causes you to believe that god exists in the first place um there's a lot of reasons I would say to answer part of what you alluded to, but didn't specifically ask. I have had times when I needed to have more of an intellectual uh, understanding of why I would believe this, you know, and it's really sweet, especially in the South. We say Jesus in your heart and, you know, and that is sweet, you know, although there's not really a place in the Bible that it tells us to ask him in our heart, but I understand the concept But it is not an answer to someone who is genuinely seeking for me to say, well, I just feel him right here in my heart Um, or 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 even or even only not saying anything because we've already fully laid the foundation that I love scripture or even for me to only say, well, it's in the Bible. Well, if you don't believe the Bible, then that's not going to be reason. So also we homeschooled. So in the process of homeschooling, we did a lot of apologetics and stuff like that. So there's several reasons why I believe there's a God. One is a very, very simple reason is because even if you believe in evolution, even if you believe in the Big Bang Theory, even if you believe in all of these things, there is always a point. As a matter of fact, I just heard something they were talking about the big the anniversary of the Big Bang Theory. And they were saying that even in the Big Bang Theory, there's this concentrated bit of matter that then exploded. Well, there's a concept in philosophy called first cause. There has to be a first cause. Nothing comes from nothing. And our our plain intellectual, even if you're not much of a philosopher, you have to admit nothing. There is no place in our human experience or in the recorded history of the world or even in prehistory in the rocks and the whatever you want to look at that nothing came from nothing. Okay, so that that to me is whether you want to call it the God of the Bible or whatever you want to call it, there has to be a first cause. So that would be where I would start with someone is, you know, explain to me how nothing, how something comes from nothing. The second one is that when you look around and of course, like I said, I'm a shepherd and I've always had a lot of animals and just in nature in general, look around If you get down to the finer points of evolution, for example, and I'm not arguing for or against evolution, I'm just saying that that you can't go from no eyeball to a perfectly functioning eyeball. That's just one little example. And so there's too many missing links for there not to be an intelligence behind the variety and the beauty and the uh, complexity of what we see in nature. In Romans, it says that the you know that anybody who looks around can see who who God is and and the basic idea of of not only who He is but how you know His nature and character. The other one is that the fact that worship is innate in human beings. Every human being on the face of this planet worships something. 
It may be money, it may be food, it may be work, it may be, as you said, children, whatever. Human beings, by their nature, worship something. Why? Why do we worship things? If there is not an innate part of who we are deep down planted in us in our eternal souls that says you need to worship something. Now, humans find lots of other things to worship besides God, but There is not a human on the planet that does not worship something. And you can talk to people. And if you continue to talk to them, you will find that they, even though they may deny it, they will in fact worship something. The other thing is the nature of human nature. There is no evolutionary reason for there to be altruism. Now, some people try to explain it in terms of survival of the species, but that's not really, it doesn't, it doesn't float when you compare it. We do a lot of things that would not ensure our survival. Correct. For the sake of altruism. Correct. <laughs> Correct. You know, um, we have compassion and empathy. Those things, and you find it in the, in the oddest places. And, and it's not just, sometimes it's not enough in the church. It's not just in people of faith. You find it all over the place. People giving up their, giving from themselves for the purpose of, lifting someone else up or protecting someone or whatever. And then the final thing is, is where does even the concept of good and bad come from? If not from a God placed conscience in human beings. Now, many people have seared their conscience and they don't feel it. But I, I dare anyone, I dare anyone to find a single individual, unless it's a truly pathological, uh, mentally ill person, that does not have some concept of some things are acceptable and other things are not acceptable. There's no reason for that to exist unless there's a higher power, you know, an eternal truth that holds true across generations and throughout all time. It just doesn't make sense. So I really feel that people who claim to be intellectually superior are oftentimes being intellectually lazy because, and I don't even know how many different things I just said, but, and I'm not even a philosopher. Yeah. You know, that's just, that's just me lay person off the top of my head, but Those are all things that you would have to explore fully and completely before you could absolutely say definitively that there is no God. Yeah. I want to ask people this question more. I feel like people don't explore this stuff as as much as I feel like we should. I feel like, you know, Peter does a good job. He's like, hey, you you need to be ready to give a reason for the hope Mm -hmm. that's in you. And one that is intellectually sound and it's not just, I mean, and there are other things and this is a place that I'm at right now. I, I'm, I'm writing a lot about these very things. And so I, I, I enjoy people who have reasons for their faith. And it's not just because that's what I was taught early mm-hmm. on, um, that they, they really consider and put these things to the test. So given that and your own faith, what do you feel like you understand a little bit, at least a little bit better about God and the way he moves now that maybe the, maybe you didn't as much before Dominic died? I think probably several things. One is, which I've spoken about before, is that there's a lot of things about the way God moves in the world that I don't understand And I've gotten more comfortable with that. Where on the one hand, I think that you're correct in saying that we do need to learn to give a reason for the faith, for our faith and and to be able to give an intellectual reason. I also think that, and again, this is a Western church thing, that we have idolized the idea that we can explain everything about who God is and how he works in the world to the nth degree. You know, we have, we have created systematic theology where we can talk about who God is exactly and what he's going to do. And if we do this and then he's going to do that and that kind of thing. So I think that I'm less comfortable with 
explaining God and, and speaking for him because he doesn't need me to defend him. So in, in the sense of how he's working in the world, I'm not talking about, you know, helping others understand that there is a God. So that's one of the things. The other thing is that his purposes are way beyond and way further out. You know, they're eternal. And we use the word eternal, but what does that mean really to any of us? We can't comprehend eternity. But that is the, that's the timeline he's working on. So I'm at a very minute speck on the spectrum of where he's, where he's ultimately going with all of this. So when he's doing things in my life, and this is, you were saying how we get so hung up in the here and now, I need to sometimes take a step back and say, you know, this may stink for today, or this may be hard for today, but I'm going to be patient and see where God is taking this. And I think as a society, we're becoming less and less patient overall because of the instantaneous nature of so many of the things that we deal with every day, you know, with our smartphones and all the other things that we, that we do. So I think patience is one of the things that I'm learning to express in the direction of how God may be moving. So I'm, I'm more willing to be patient. And I think that his long game is, is something that I have come to, I've come to accept better since, since Dominic died. I think there's also, it's easy to get into the habit, especially when we were homeschool in the homeschool community. Uh, we were not part of this particular trend, but there was a trend within the homeschool community, kind of like you could sort of program how your kids were going to turn out if you just did these certain things and kept them away from certain things. And I mean, it's not just the homeschoolers that's been yeah. a long, but, yeah. it, but, it, but it really kind of reached a peak, you know? And I think that um, that's a dangerous way to think. And I have, I, I didn't think that I had imbibed that uh, Kool-Aid, but to some extent when Dominic first died, I felt like, really, you know, really? Um, our family was very involved in church. We did a lot of lay ministry. My kids were in the praise band. We, you know, did all kinds of service. Did I mean, just unbelievable the hours, the the volunteer hours we spent and, and the, the ways we had mentored other people and discipled other people. And I thought, really? Okay, so you're going to take my kid, you know, or not, I should, let me back up. God did not take my son. He allowed the accident to happen. That's very important right. to me. He yeah. did not reach down and take my child. Don't, I don't want anybody to think that or that, think that I think that. But, you know, you're going to let my kid be the one who dies in the accident, and you're going to save this other person. Not long after Dominic died, there was a, an incident where this man went into a Colorado theater and shot a whole bunch of people, and he was like 50-something years old. And I can remember thinking at that moment, he got to live for 50-something years so he could mm. go shoot a bunch of other people, and Dominic died at 23, you yeah. know. But I've since come to understand and accept that, again, God's playing the long game. So I guess that's really, that's really how I, it's changed. It's changed where I have a, a more seasoned and deliberate eternal focus. Yeah. And that's good. I would think though, over this time, and as you've matured in your faith and given the experiences that you've had as well, and, and you've, you've sort of referenced a few sort of cultural memes that Christians float around that you can find on throw pillows and <laughs> you know the things that you can buy at uh, Christian stores that have the messages written on them and, and that sort of thing what are some truths that you've come to know about God specifically and maybe especially as it may be counter to what the culture tends to communicate well, one which comes up all the time in uh, brief parents groups, and it comes up all the time on social media, is the idea that God won't give you more than you can handle. Yeah. Which is a particularly negative concept for several reasons. One, it's not in the Bible. I think some people get, get confused. There's a reference in Corinthians that no temptation has fallen fallen befallen you that is not common to man and God will give you a way out. That's talking about temptation, right. not about pain and suffering. So 
God will give you more than you can handle. And he does, he, and he will allow more than you can handle, but he will be there with you to help you bear it. Other things like that though? Yeah. I think another one is that suffering is, is out of the ordinary. We live in an era right now, uh, for example, child loss, even though I'm submerged in that community, when you consider the number of children in the, just take the United States, for example, and the number that die every year, it's a tiny, tiny fraction of the children that exist in the United States and or are born every year. And so we live in an era where if you're sick, you get antibiotics. So that's one of the reasons that COVID has been such a devastating experience for people is because all of a sudden, especially at the beginning, there weren't even effective treatments. So it was pretty, it was frequently once you got to the hospital point, you know, it was a death sentence yeah. and people just couldn't wrap their minds around that. But um, if you look in the Bible, there's nothing, especially in the New Testament, look at the epistles. Over and over, people are not told if you suffer, suffer. you're told when you suffer, when you suffer. You, this should be your approach to suffering. This should be your understanding of suffering. And so because we've lived in an era when it feels like suffering is unusual, when people suffer, again, back to the idea that, you know, maybe they did something wrong, mm-hmm. you know, like Job's comforters, you know, well, Job, you may, you may think you're above it all, but I'm sure there's some hidden sin here somewhere. Yeah. I really hate that frequently we tell people or at least present the idea, if not, if not openly, but subtly that come to Jesus and everything's going to be fine. Yeah. And the reality is that there are a lot of Jesus loving people in this world who starve. There are a lot of Jesus loving people in this world who get sold into slavery, not necessarily the old slavery in the United States, but they're domestic servants or whatever, you know, how they get caught up in these things. There's a lot of believers that, suffered horrible diseases that if they had the right medicine, they wouldn't have to suffer, but they live in a part of the world that they don't have the right medicine. So suffering is not an unusual thing, and it's not always the result of sin. Now, if I sin, I may have to suffer the consequences of yeah, my sin. still consequences, yeah. But this is the thing. Either Jesus came to pay the debt, or he didn't. If he came to pay the debt, then when I suffer... It's the result of a fallen world. It's the result of other people's choosing, you know, to sin against me or, 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 or sometimes my own sin and I'm reaping the consequences of it. So I don't like that we act like suffering and pain are unusual things. Yeah. And we get, we, we, as a society overall, we have very little uh, threshold or tolerance for anything uncomfortable. Yes. We move toward the most comfortable position we can in all circumstances. And when, when there is trial and when there is suffering, often people express their displeasure with God right? because of that. And, and we don't see that as part of being in sort of the, the human condition. condition. That's right. And another thing too, on that note that I think is important for the body of Christ to recognize is, and this is one of the things that bereaved parents do experience, and it's not unique to bereaved parents. It can be someone who's suffering from cancer, especially cancer that lasts a long time, Yeah, is we kind of have this, you know, let's take prayer requests, and someone can be on the prayer list for, you know, a month or six weeks or maybe two months, depending on what's going on. But then people get tired of hearing that, you know, that Susie is still struggling with the loss of her child or, you know, Mary still is going through chemo treatments and she needs, you know, she still needs meals every week or whatever. And we pull away from that for the very reason that you said, we don't like to consider pain and suffering. We move to a place of comfort and when we are uncomfortable with other people's pain and suffering because it makes us wonder If we were in the same situation, would we have this ongoing pain and discomfort? And nobody wants to think about that. Yeah. Yeah. I think about sort of an analogy of an athlete who's training for something. Uh, If it's a runner or boxer or football or or whatever it may be, I run. And when I've been my best at running, I began to learn the importance of, I, I would sort of say this to myself. I would be like 
relish the resistance or rejoice in the resistance. Early on, I would I would have preferred when I'm running um, a nice gentle downhill slope. Maybe the wind at my back, mm-hmm. probably sixty degrees and 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 sunny would have been perfect. And and what I've learned is it's the resistance that makes us the better version of ourselves. So when we resist resistance, when we um, run from adversity, when we flee to comfort, Mm. we're not allowing ourselves to be shaped in a way that's going to make us better down the line. It can be painful. And, you know, you think about somebody who works out, what happens when they work those muscles? Well, they're sore later. Mm -hmm. It's painful. Right. That's part of the, the, the muscles being torn, which sounds terrible, but it must be torn to grow. Right. And, and, and that's just a spiritual truth and a truth of life. And so it's not that we need to, uh, and heck, back in, back in New Testament, those guys actually did do some high-fiving when they got beaten, tortured, and thrown mm-hmm. in jail. They were like, yay, <laughs> we suffered for Christ. Yeah. Because they, I don't think they were masochists necessarily. I think it was because they were like, okay. We're doing his work that we, we knew this was coming and all this is doing is shaping us and making us better in our own faith. And then down the line at some point for the faith of others. Right. And and I look at you, you're eight years down the line and does it hurt you? Yeah, it hurts you. Is it going to hurt you for the rest of this life? Probably. Yeah. I don't see that changing, but the person that you are now, as it relates to the work that God is doing through you is not the same person that you were just eight years ago. And Correct. it has shaped you into somebody that I think God smiles at often. I hope so. I mean, I look at the stuff that you do and I'm like, she's needed in this world. She's needed in this world. And when I read the comments that other people write, I promise you, people are moved and pointed toward Christ through the love that you show them in the way that you articulate the things that they don't know how to articulate. I I can see it, and I'm not a bereaved parent. Well, I hope that's that's been the primary outcome of the work of God in my life. That was always, that's always been what I desired, that he would let me be a door through which other people could be invited into the love of Christ. And that's kind of goes back to when you were saying about God being a vindictive God. And I think that's another way that grief shapes you is you just lean in. I should say how grief can shape you. It doesn't always happen. You lean into the love of Christ, you know, and that he is so gracious and so merciful and so loving, even here, even now. I'm very thankful I, I felt like when we first got into to the conversation, when, when we I was reaching out to a few months ago, that it was going to be mostly a conversation about your experience of being a bereaved parent. But what we've learned and what we've done and what we've talked about today isn't as involved in the emotion of the loss as it is in in the truths around the way God is in the world and, and what bereaved parents specifically experience, not just bereaved parents, but people experiencing loss. I think it's more of a universal truth than just bereaved parents. And your perspectives that you've offered today are really, really important. And I think, I think that those have been seasoned and shaped in large part, not just because of your own experience, but but what you've done since that time and spending time articulating and putting Mm -hmm. these things into words and then having that pull you into this community where you spend time in this world. And there'll be information on the website and in the episode description of the life I didn't choose blog. You just gotta, you just, if you're, especially if you're a bereaved parent, but if you're have experienced anything in the loss arena, I think you can go there and find places where, there are spiritual truths articulated, and not just spiritual truths, but the way people feel that will make you make you understand that you're not alone. And so it's uh, thelifeididn'tchoose.com, isn't that right? Correct. 
Yeah. And if you do a search, I mean, you publish stuff in HuffPost, and I feel like I've seen a few other places where your 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 writing has been published. And so Melanie is a amazing resource for those in this space, but I'm so thankful that we finally got together and that you made the drive and we're able to sit across the table from each other and have this level of a spiritual conversation. I don't, I think that whether you're in a place of um, bereavement, uh, loss of any kind or not, that God spoke through you today. And I think, um, at least to me anyway, I, I get the advantage of listening to this episode about <laughs> seven more times as I go through the editing process. So I get oh, to yippee. I get to bake it all in uh, <laughs> to me. This is one of the advantages uh, that I have. But is there anything I didn't ask you about that you'd like to mention? I think the only thing that I would really encourage people who are walking with others who are grieving to do is to be patient and to be present and to understand that they don't need to be perfect. I think that is one of the things that sometimes stops us from reaching out when we otherwise would. And um, I just know that bereaved parents in anyone who's experienced profound loss often feel alone, and they feel alone for years. It's not just what we normally think around the time of a loss, the funeral and the short the time shortly afterwards. So if you know a bereaved parent and you know that child's birthday or find out the child's birthday, just a text. It does, you don't have to send flowers. You don't have to do anything big. A text. If the bereaved child would have graduated from high school in a certain year, reach out to that parent because guess what's all over Facebook in May, you yeah. know, is graduation pictures. Mm-hmm. Just Things like that are huge. They are huge, and you cannot even begin to imagine the impact that they have on bereaved parents. And I guess that would be the one thing we kind of didn't get into uh, was how to support a bereaved parent if you're mm, not one. Yeah, um, and I think the, people are, are afraid that if they bring that up, they're just dredging up pain for them. And let me tell you something. I have told everyone I know, I'm already sad. You can't make me any sadder, but you can make me feel like my son matters. Yeah. Yeah, that and makes that's, sense. That's and huge. I think that's helpful. That should be a real takeaway for people who don't know how to support people in this situation mm-hmm. and 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 don't know how to approach them. Yeah. I've learned that in the few times that I've had these kinds of conversations. It's like, don't avoid talking about my child. Mm-hmm. Don't avoid talking about my, my spouse mm-hmm. who's gone. Right. And it doesn't, and again, I just want people to understand it does not have to be a big show or anything profound. It's just, hey, I was thinking about you today, mm-hmm. and I realize, you know, you're coming up on the date of your child's passing, or I realize that all of your kids' peer group are getting married, and I'm seeing a lot of baby announcements or yeah. marriage announcements or something, you know, and I'm, I'm sure you really miss them right now. You know, something like that. It's, it's tiny but huge. Yeah. That's good. It's good to know that that doesn't hurt them. Yeah. And that's, I think, I think people have good intentions, but they can <laughs> look like not good intentions because we, they just don't know what to do, I guess. So and, and that's fair. That's good. That's good. Uh, Melanie Simone, I really appreciate you coming. I, I appreciate not only that, but I appreciate your servanthood and the way that you pour things out for other people. For you to come here and do this today, there's nothing in it for you other than knowing that you are doing the work of God and being able to articulate and express the things that that you've learned, and it's for the benefit of other people, and so I really appreciate you coming. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. When I talk to people of faith who've lost close loved ones, especially children, I find that one of the most important things for them is that there be purpose in the loss. And when we talk about this kind of purpose, these people clearly are not searching for why their loved one died. They don't ask, what was the purpose of them dying? Rather, they ask, what purpose can it serve for others going forward? None of the people of faith that I've spoken with who have lost a child or spouse believe that God took them. They do, however, believe that God intends good to come from it 
and most of them play an active role in manifesting that intention. Melanie De Simone is an example of this as she strongly carries the flag of agent of the Lord in comforting those who mourn. I hope she inspires others in grief to be an agent of purpose that could only be born from their pain. Thank you for joining us today on A Stronger Faith. God delivers people like Melanie to us through listeners just like you. If you feel that God is bringing someone to mind that you know to be a person of great faith, who may even have a bit of a story behind their faith, please reach out to us by sending an email to connect at astrongerfaith.com or by visiting our website at astrongerfaith.com and clicking the recommend a guest button right on the home page. Also, if you've struggled with grief or are struggling with grief, or if you know someone buried in grief, we strongly encourage you to visit the blog, The Life I Didn't Choose. You can do a Google search of The Life I Didn't Choose and it'll pull right up. Or you can also type in thelifeidentchoose.com and get there. It's a wealth of content and insight into the world of grief that is valuable to every single person. You can also connect with Melanie there. For more episodes like this one, to connect with us, to recommend a guest, or to support what we're doing, please visit astrongerfaith.com. Until next time, we pray for peace and a stronger faith for you and those you love.